it's time for our presentation. Karen Vaughn Harding is going to be our judge and our presenter today. She's a respected watercolor artist and an esteemed judge from Rockford, Illinois. She owns La Paloma, La Paloma Gardens and has been involved as an artist for many years in Rockford and throughout the country. Details of her biography are in your folder on pages three through five. Karen was here last night and I had a chance to be part of a conversation with her and I am really looking forward to her presentation. Just in a five or 10 minute conversation, I picked up some great tips. So Karen, thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. I forget I have my own microphone. Are we okay? Okay. Um, you can take that off there if you want. I just turn it off? No, I mean you could take it with you. It's on the cord. Oh no, I've got one right here. Well, I apologize if you came here this morning thinking that you would get lots of hot tips on how I actually do my artwork. And it's not as if I have the secret of the ages. I'm just one of many watercolor artists. I just have my own way of doing it. And it's um, very, very, for me, I consider it to be intensive. I have suffered since I was a small child with dyslexia. So I can't do two things at once. I have to paint or I have to speak. And I can't, I'm not good at, at doing them simultaneously. So also my technique is multiple layers. I mean, I have, Anne has been in my class, Ara has been in my class, and maybe some other people I, that I don't see. Um, and you know, we lay down color, layer after layer after layer. It's transparent watercolors. They're liquid and they need to dry. You can dry them with a hair dryer, of course, but I like to watch the colors commingle and see what's happening. And as I paint, the painting grows. I have, I, I try always to think of what I want the finished piece to look like. So obviously you start out with a blank piece of paper. I usually, I've done an experiment on this group I'm going to show you today. I usually paint on the same paper with the same paints with the same brushes in the same humidity. Now you think humidity, oh big deal. Well, watercolor makes a big deal of, a great deal of difference when it's 88% humidity or three or 13 or whatever it is. So, um, and it affects the way the paints work with one another. I try to paint always in the same way, the same place with my things around me. I can't go plein air because I'm too distracted. I hear birds and I think, oh nice, I'm not going to, oh I'll listen, I'll watch them. And, and the, everything, and then I look back and say, where was I? So to me that's too distracting. So I paint in my studio with just music on. I don't watch television. I don't listen to books on tape. I just listen to music and then my mind seems to be able to focus itself. I um, originally thought I should just paint landscapes like everyone else did. That, that, that's great. I'll just do landscapes. Well, none of them resembled the area that I was looking at. <laughs> I thought, well, that's not a good idea. I think I'll just, well, then I'll, I think I'll do, ah, I'll do things you can eat. <laughs> so all my initial paintings were all food. <laughs> they were just totally food. And I would just, I went through all my cookbooks, I went through all these things, and I thought, well, this is just marvelous. Look at that, it's un unlimited. So in the beginning, there were things like fruits. And so we just did them, and I use, as I say, radiant watercolors. And you can see, those of you that paint with watercolors, they're very, very bright. They're actually almost considered to be inks. It's just the pigment and water. That's all it is. When you have tube paints, depending on the quality of the paint, you have, you can have, they can be filled with maybe not even 50% paint. Maybe not even 50% pigment. They might be 35. And that's, if, the, if you've ever tried watercolors and not succeeded, the more that the filler in the paint, the muddier it gets. 
when you have the little box of praying paints and you've got your eight colors, I almost defy anyone not to make mud. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's impossible because it's, it's mud to start with. So it, it's not transparent, it's not clear, and it's never going to be no matter how careful you are. So you've, you've kind of tied your hands behind your back if you don't use good quality materials. Um, I think you, I don't know, maybe Brian or other watercolorists here might disagree, but I think, I think you can, if you have a great brush, you can get away with lesser product. But if you have a lesser product and a lesser brush, you're never going to get anything. And the lesser the paper, the lesser the quality. So give yourself a good start. At least start with the middle ground of everything. And you can easily go on the internet and find the rankings of which is the best paper, which has no acid in it. The, the acid count of the, of the paper is very important. That You, you want to have the purest paper you can because if you're going to go to all the trouble to paint a piece on, of, of your own work and really detail it and work. I'm not, I'm not talking about wetting the paper, throwing some paint at it and walking away from it. I'm talking a really serious watercolor that's studied. If you look around this room, there are some incredible work, works. Not just in watercolor, but there's very, very, very advanced, fabulous watercolors in this room. I think you should all be proud. Everyone who's in this show, all artists, it was a really difficult job to judge this show. We took two days. Every single piece was photographed. They're all on my computer. I studied all of them. And, and I must say, there's some pieces that really, really, really are fabulous in all the media. So it's, as I agree with everyone who's spoken, it's a fabulous show. Be proud that you're in it. Be proud that you were part of it. So now, back to our, our task at hand. I'm going to tell you today about, um, because I can't demonstrate, I mean I could, but it, it, it's impossible for you to see what I'm doing up here. So it's, it's sort of unfair. Oh, here, I put some paint down. Isn't that nice? <laughs> kind of won't work. So I'm, I decided to switch it around and because when, if, you're, if you've been at it a while, you've got a lot of pieces of artwork around your house and you think to yourself, you know, it looks a little conceited to have all of my walls covered with my paintings. Oh, I'll hang a few of my fellow artists. Hmm. No, I think I'll put mine back up. Well, pretty soon, you know, you only have so many walls in your house. And as Picasso says over there, painting is just another way of keeping a diary. Yeah. All right? So long ago I decided that I had to find some other outlet <laughs> rather than the walls for my paintings. And that's when I thought about just, just turning them into cards. And I've done that. And um, first of all, I thought I would show you a series that's going to come out next spring. So when I paint, there are eight cards in each uh, set. And when I paint, I have my ideas of what it's going to be. So this set that's coming out in the spring is going to be eight bouquets of spring flowers. And what I usually do is I start all eight of them and I start and I use, I paint through them with one color. So I'm, I will go through the eight pieces and paint all the greens. So I make myself all my palettes, these are just the, the palettes, my green palettes, and I have a box of just my green paints. So I make up all my green paint that I think I might use. And then I go through piece by piece and I paint in the green. All right? Yes, I draw everything out very precisely before I do it. Yeah, yeah it springs out just like that. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, there's no way I could, you know, God knows I need all the help I can get besides a picture, you know. 
I, so the green is this, I always do the green because mine are florals. There's basically a lot of green in them. So for me, I start with the green and build from there. So now we've gone through the green palette on those. Then we usually move to the contrasting color, the orange or the red. And I contrast that. And then we get up to the stage where we're getting kind of near, nearer finished. So they're not finished yet, but they're coming along. And then we pretty much get one finished. So then now, okay, we've got one eighth of them kind of worked out. Now, sometimes this is not my normal paper. This is what happened. It's not a biggie, but it just shows you how I saturate my paper. Now this is 140 pound paper. My normal paper is 300 pound. This is 300 pound paper. Obviously, no leaks, but I, I'm experimenting with a new type of paper. A company sent me this paper and asked me to paint on it and give them, their rea give them my reaction to it. Well, for 140 pound paper, it's a nice average paper, but it doesn't fit my needs for how I like to paint. So I'm gonna tell them that, but I mean, for a beginning artist, it'd be fine. Not, not a problem. So then, when you look at this, it's, it's, it's kind of finished, but you know, I have to do more work on it. So then I say to myself, now, let's think about this. It has to go into production. How's, what's gonna be the next step? So before I take it to be photographed, I go over it with a, with a magnifying glass. And because this is the original and it's watercolor, I can't get a really sharp line because water just won't go in a straight, sharp line as a pen point will or something like that. So I go over it very carefully and look for pencil marks and things like that. But I always spill. I always have marks. Paintbrush dropped right here, green mark on paper, bad. Um, there's always uh, water splatters, and it's going to be printed. So I go over those and I take away those that I can. Then I have, all right, tip. Q-tips, bleach from your laundry room. Just go get a little teeny tiny little container, put some bleach in it, get some Q-tips, and very carefully just dab a little of the bleach onto your piece, take it off and blot it up with a clean rag, cloth. Don't use paper towels because they have a lot of chemicals in them. So just when you're, you know, you have t-shirts or anything, keep, keep them as light as possible so you can just throw them in the washer and bleach them, that's what I do. And then a little bleach, dab it, bleach, dab it, bleach, dab it. Don't try to get it all out at once because it'll affect your paper. Even though this is not handmade paper, it's rolled. So it's pressed much tighter than the paper I normally use. But you, you'll still scar the paper. So don't, don't rub it. Just press on it very lightly. And eventually, it'll completely go away. Which is always comforting that you don't have blotches and blobs. Then, when, when I have all eight of them, I take it to a fellow who photographs it for me. And we, he has a huge format digital camera. We transfer it into my computer or his computer, it doesn't matter which one, blow it up to 700 times what the human eye can see, and we work by pixel by pixel by pixel to make sure everything's clean and tidy. Because then the sharp edges, when printed, really stand out. And that's what we want in the end. And while it's in the computer, I use Photoshop, and while it's in the computer, you can decide. Do you want to have it on a white background? Or do you want to lift it and put it on another background? So here's an example. Here's the original painting.
It's wallpaper now. It's been turned into wallpaper. You know, when you can't have enough paintings around, then make wallpaper. <laughs> and some of them I make wrapping paper out of. And um, you just, you know, it's the other ways of just using your, your work. Because there's limited wall space in the world. And all your friends and all the people that come up to you don't have room for, for pieces of artwork in their house. So now I've got a new outlet. Here's someone for, if you don't know this one already, ch grandchildren, starting apartments and houses. Every birthday, every Christmas, they, <laughs> they get something for their walls. So you can get rid of a lot. Just, you know, just get the cheapest frames on them you can. Don't do them well. Just put a frame on them. Oh, thanks. My grandkids call me graham cracker, so thanks, <laughs> JC. So um, anyway, so I'll leave these up here. These belong to Hannah. Hannah scooped up the last dark ones I have. So you can look at the backs of these and see the, how we've changed the backgrounds. One of the advantages of manipulating them in Photoshop is that when you put them in, you can lift them up and slide a background behind them. And you can choose. You can you know, go over it and see which one looks the best. Now, then you get to find out how to box the, package them. And then you get to find out how to market them. And then it just becomes ever so much more fun. Just going on and on and on. If you, if when you start any project, at least this is what I've found over time, think to yourself, what do you want it to look like when it's completely finished? I can't, well, you could, but it's very difficult to maintain, uh, to, to, as an afterthought, go back and paint the background in a watercolor painting. It's very, very, very difficult. It's possible, but keeping the consistency, even though my, my paints are consistent, much more consistent than if I just mix them up and use them, there's still a variation. I can't guarantee that I'm gonna have a nice, solid background. But if I wash it first, I can have a more consistent background. You, you can choose, you can also find tinted watercolor paper. It exists. It comes in light grays and light blues and light pinks, fleshy colors. You can't expect to find it at Michael's. But it's, if you look in the catalogs or online, you can find it. And it doesn't distort your color balance so, too much. I don't know, Brian, what do you think? Well, I've worked at it in the past. You know, it does give, if you're doing a light layer wash, you get a little bit of a subtle difference what you're trying to achieve. So I paint a 140 cold press. Okay. I tape it down and I use moderate water. I don't soak it. Right. So I work in small areas and bounce all around it. Um, but like my preference is white uh, in the long run. Any other watercolors here? What do you think? Or white paper versus like the paper. colored paper. I like white paper, even yeah. better than the unbleached, you know. Yeah. White, white. Okay. Well, there you have your consensus <laughs> from the the group. I um. I tend to think in color families, so I sort my paints by by families, and so if I know I'm going to do my greens. I have a whole tray of greens and I have all the different greens that I own. I have liquids and, and tube paints and mixtures that I've mixed before. And um, I'm, I don't know if you other people know about this, but um, these are children's paints from Dick Blick. They're school quality paints. But when I have huge, huge backgrounds or huge pieces to paint, of one color, I use these. I mean, this this thing is about four dollars, and this is about fourteen. So, it you have to use more of this. It's not as intense, but for playing around or for just covering vast areas, 
It's perfectly okay. It's, the intensity isn't there. That's the, co the whole cost is the intensity. That's the, that's the, the equation. It's the only binder in that water also? There's none, no. What bind? Oh, yeah, it's water. Yes, it's, that's it. And the same thing with your little. Right. Fish. Yeah. It's just water. And it's concentrated water color. It's right. It's radiant. It's, it's pigment. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's. Um, like if you got ground pigment, you could, pure pigment, you could put it in a bottle of water and you essentially have that. Mm -hmm. The only, there's a few, there's a few elements that have to have a little alcohol with them, and they're, they're marked. It's mostly the fugitive colors, the colors that when you put them together, they sort of bounce away from one another. And those are usually the ones that have just a little carrier with them besides the water. But you don't have to worry about the chemistry of anything. I didn't do well in chemistry class. So uh, I read it, I go, oh, that's nice. It must be relative, it's sort of like a covalent bond. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I just, I th other things are more important. So then I, okay, I do, a, I do a color family, and then I do my palettes. And as you can see, I have a number of palettes in the same family. And when I travel, I don't take any of this with me except two little brushes or three brushes. And I fill these up. I don't fill them, but I, I put paint in them, and I let it dry. And when they're all dry, I put them in Ziploc bags, and off I go with a pile of these and some paper. And I only take paper that'll fit in the bottom of my suitcase, and the, uh, the size of the suitcase, the biggest suitcase I'm taking. I usually take a block, and then I can, I, I, I know I told you I only painted in one place, but when I go away for two months, I have to take things with me, and so. That's what I do. And, I, and some of those aren't good. When I come home, I look at them, I say, well, good, you passed the time, but you really didn't make a good painting here. <laughs> so it goes in the file. I have this uh, flat file. It's pretty full <laughs> of things that never make it to the press. So um, one of the things I try very, very hard when I have students and some of you have been at it a great long time. Some of you haven't been at it at all. And you're thinking about it. Just let yourself go. Just do it. You know, you may never paint a barn or your house or whatever it is you're, going to, you're trying to paint. But the point is just have fun. Just open it up. You know, life is a canvas. Throw all the paint you can. I'm serious. Just, just let yourselves go, and, and pretty soon you'll find a kindred spirit somewhere, and you don't. Ha you, you'll find that my. You have the most wonderful facility here, in this building and this organization. And I mean, I'm. I tell people all the time. I'm just dumbfounded by the art community here in Janesville. It's really quite vibrant, and you should be very proud of it, and support it all you can. So now we have to talk about one other thing. Well, more than one thing. Um, if, if you try, you've, you've finally gotten up the courage and you've painted a few things and you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to enter the um, show. And I'm really going to work hard and try to do that. My suggestion is Really learn all you can about it before you submit your ego to it. I think it's marvelous that you, th this group asked me for the criteria that I judge with. Well, that's very important for everyone to know. I mean, it's, it's very, you know, it's knowing the temperature of the water before you plunge in. And follow the rules of what and the criteria for the show. I've had many times been the judge, and there's a piece that comes in, and it's, it's quite nice, but it's not, it shouldn't be in that show. Keep track of your artwork. Keep track of when you painted it or produced it. You could start painting one year and finish it five years later. 
but the year it's finished, it ha should have that date on it. Because many times you're not allowed to enter things that are more than a year old or two years old. So Picasso says, just it's a diary. Put the date on the back. Put the name of what it is. If it's a flower, put the botanic name on it. Don't just call it red poppy. I mean, I do that. But I also have the botanical name on it. You know, or if there's seven poppies in it, there's a piece back there called seven poppies. Well, clever. There's seven poppies and it's, you know. But I have the botanical names, I have the date, and I have, um, if it's out of my garden, if it was a photograph from my garden, then I put it fo from photograph, and, and I put the date of the photograph, or if it's in my computer, I put that information on it so I can find it again. It's, nothing's more mysterious than thinking, gosh, I know there was more to finish. You've got a piece, it's almost finished, and you think, oh, where's that picture? Where is that? You don't have any idea. Well, I mean, I don't. You probably would, but I don't have any idea where it is. And so I've, I've learned that I have to catalog everything to be able to find it, to know the date, to, 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 to be able to, oftentimes they think, oh, I'll put that piece in. And, and then I read the stipulations of the show, and it says, must be painted within the last two years. Well, it's four years old. I suppose I could do that, but, you know, they want, two year, they want your current work. So you need to give what is asked for. Brian said, last year I said a note to Brian that if he would have had two pieces, it would have been easier to judge. So Brian put in two, two pieces this year. It was easier to judge. Because you don't know if it's just a fluke, but it says you can bring two pieces of artwork here. And some of the people have two different media. Well, it's kind of, you think, wow, that's really good. But wait, where's the other piece? Wow, that's really good. What am I gonna do? You don't have to worry about that if you're only entering watercolors. I don't have to worry about it if I'm only entering my watercolors, but from a judge's standpoint, there's a difference for what you put in a show. Also, if you're going to enter a show, try to go in a softer, what I consider a softer show first. Don't go up against the big league people the first time you enter. It's, it's a huge step to get, to get your things ready, to meet the criteria, and enter a show. Plus, you have to pay money to do it usually. So make it as easy on yourself as you can. And once you get that first blue ribbon, of course, then you're, you're already on the diving board. You may as well dive into the next big show and really win first prize there. And keep track of the shows you enter. And keep track of what you've put in that show. You'll think to yourself, five years later, you'll look back and say, did I really do all that work in 2018? I can't believe I did that. Well, you'll be happy because you'll be much older and you're like, I couldn't do that now. <laughs> so anyway, as I say, when, you, when you're painting, when you're starting a painting, think to yourself how you want it to look when it's finished. So I paint paintings and I don't, my criteria isn't to start out to, to paint a scarf because scarves are an end product, as the cards are, they're not my original paintings. But I've been asked to do a mural. <sighs> I think that was really, I must have been very weak that day, I don't know. But anyway, um, they, it's, it's to be 40 feet long. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. 40 feet long and six feet tall. So it's, it's in panels, obviously, you know. It's going to be on one continuous piece of paper because Arches makes paper in rolls that will fulfill that criteria. So it will be on one solid piece when finished. However, I'm, all I think about night and day is, okay, I've got like four panels painted and then I spill a whole pot of paint. And then my bleach Q-tip trick won't work. And I have to start all over again. Oh, God, it's a nightmare. So, of course, what 
I'm doing is I'm, I started in the center and I'm working my way out. And sometimes, most I'm right-handed and I tend to move as I read. All right, we go from left to right. Well, this way for you, um, most of you. And um, consequently, if I paint that way, I am not painting over what I've already painted, so I, that's fine, I'm moving along the painting. But I also lose track of where I am. So if I paint this panel, and then I come over here and paint this panel, or two panels away, I can concentrate more on that as an individual piece for this big mural. I also find that I do that when I paint the flowers. Concentrate, oh, sorry. Uh, concentrate on, I have to concentrate on this. So I have my palette out with all of these colors. Now this has, this is only the beginning. There's maybe, oh, I don't know, four or five or six layers on this. Many, many more layers of color will go on because what happens, and this isn't my normal paper. The normal paper I use because it's handmade is layers like this. Many, many layers of paper. And depending on the amount of paint I put on, it percolates down through those layers. And so the luminosity of the paint has to do with how much pigment is in that paper. The thicker the paper, the more pigment it can hold, the bolder the color becomes, or the more delicate the paper, the, the, the paint reacts. Because there's more, you know, it's thicker, it's a thicker blanket. It can hold much more. So as this is experimental paper for me, I may not get the full effect that I wish to have, but it's, it's what's going to happen on this paper. And I may, I may finish all of these for publication, and maybe when I'm all said and done, they won't, they won't be, I don't want to say up to my standards, you know. <laughs> I, they just might not be vibrant enough to be printed. Now, you can tweak a lot of things on, in Photoshop. You can tweak the colors. I really try very, very, very hard not to do that. I, I have my printer, when they finally come from the, the computer, the files are sent to the printer, and it's done with, I do mine in, with lithography, all right? They're lithographed. They're not photocopied in the printer like you have at home. I think I've gone to all this work to do it. I want the best result from the printer I can get. Not the cheapest, but the best. Here again, I want to use good paper, good quality, good ink. I want the printer to use good quality, good paper, good ink. When you feel the thickness of this paper and you see how they're printed, you'll know right away that this is, it's, it's the best that can happen with what I've done. So, well, I suppose it could be better, but for me it's good enough. And as one of my friends says, it's certainly good enough for Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> and I said, nerve. Anyway, I know. I know. I know. So now, at this point, I want to ask, does anyone have a question? Yes. Pardon me? What's your favorite paper? Oh, um, arches, 300 pound. That's my favorite. And... Um, but now the mural only comes, that roll paper only comes 140. So that's going to, you know, uh, 54 inches. It's close enough to six feet for government work. You know, no, but it's going to be mounted. So there'll be, you know, there'll be an edge around it. So it's going to be six, I think, I think they want 62 in finish. But, you know, this, I can only give them 54, so. Well, I mean centimeters. So. Well, oh, it's water. It's a water lily. Oh, that. I'm sorry. I, I meant to show you this. So these are some of the panels. Um, that. Let's see how I can get. 
Yeah, you know, these this here we go. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, Claudia. So these are two of the panels. And this is actually six feet, and this is six feet. <laughs> I'm using a larger than my number 10 brush, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's going to be in a museum in Chicago. So um, I'm not supposed to tell because it's an it's a anonymous gift to the museum. So these are some more panels. So you've seen, um, let's see, 12, uh, 24 feet of it <laughs> right here. You can all say you know the secret. <laughs> so um, anyway, you uh, don't be afraid to use optics, all right? Um, David Hockney, d you, I'm sure you're familiar with David Hockney. David Hockney, Alan, you probably have this book in your library. His book on artists and on the history of art, optics and art, David Hockney's book is fabulous. And you will, it's more art history than you'll ever want to know, but it's worth reading because he shows you how Renaissance paintings were done when they had no concept of how to do it, actually, to paint it. I mean, you look at the, uh, um, for instance, paintings of, Holbein's paintings of Henry VIII, you know, yeah. like this. Well, there are absolute distortions in that picture. When you look at all those paintings, they don't, we don't see the distortion because our eyes are fooled. But David Hockney points out how it was done and reflected with mirrors and how the light came onto them and how the, all the lace and all those ruffs and uh, oriental carpets were painted when they have all this dimension in the tapestries and in the folds of the fabrics. He, he, it'll, it'll enlighten you, it'll give you a completely new perspective on perspective. I mean, this, this photograph of the bridge here. Isn't that marvelous perspective? It's bold. There are other pieces in here that the perspective needs to be worked on. This is a photograph. But if that were a painting and it was done that precisely, that would have an incredibly bold and affecting thought go through your, your mind when you looked at it. Sometimes we can't tell when we look at something and we see it and we go, there's just something not right about that. Mm -hmm. It's the perspective, usually. Rarely is it the color, but it's the perspective on how someone's put it on. I put my paintings up on the wall. When I brought these, they, they were all up on the wall. And I look at them from, from here to there and I think to myself, holy tuna fish, that ribbon is the silliest thing I've ever seen. And then I, I take my bleach and I get rid of it. And then I do it again or I change it because it, it, the way I painted it, it couldn't naturally go that way. So you have to be realistic unless you're doing an abstract piece of work. And then, you know, not many of us that work in watercolor do abstracts. So they're much more realistic usually. But perspective is a very important part of your painting. So you might, if you don't have that book, borrow it from the university and get it ready for people to check out because it's, it's really worthwhile. And even if you don't read all the text, just read what each painting, I mean, each photograph, because he explains what's, why he's using that photograph and the point he's trying to make with each photograph he uses. Mm -hmm. Would you say the name of it again? I think it's the the historical use of optics or optics in art or it's David Hockney he's only written one book I think okay. well he may have written more but it's huge it's a big book you know so when you look it up look under his name and then say big book <laughs> <laughs> that'll help you, How do you spell that? Hockney H-O-C-K-N-E-Y he's a British artist uh-huh 
What are the liquid uh, watercolors you use, um, the brand? I use PH Martins, okay. but there's a number of them that are available. Pardon me? You can buy those locally. Here? I think. Yeah, I buy mine out of, uh, I buy them online and I buy them from Florida okay. because um, you can order bottles of the ones you want. I don't want to buy the whole 57 sets because they come in, they come in four sets, A, B, C, and D. And I don't want, you know, I can only use so much coffee in my painting. <laughs> I mean the color coffee or mahogany. So, I mean, I go through, I order individual colors on, online. And um, I also use, I use, um, this is Winsor Newton. And they call theirs brilliant watercolors. And I, I use tube paint. I, I don't have anything against tube paint. Um, oh, these are, these are cheapies. I'm painting that big mural, you know. I need a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I mean, I, I decided when I started this project, as much as I needed to use, I decided to buy cases, in other words, like 12 tubes at a time. So I didn't want to be in the middle of something and, and be out of that color. Mm -hmm. Now, n none of these colors is so pejorative that I can't go a little to the left or the right of the color. You know, I can, you could pretty much get by, but it, it's, it's also peace of mind to know that, you know, when you've got so, 10 pounds of flour, you know you can bake a cake. Not to worry. <laughs> Speaking of cakes, isn't this a marvelous piece right here? Yeah, uh -huh. The carrot cake recipe? It's fabulous. And then I also have, I also use, um, for certain backgrounds and certain things, I use the Liquitex acrylics. I don't use them very much because m most of the acrylics are fugitive to the watercolors. So I don't use it a lot, but where I need it, Sometimes you need a little opaque. I use, I use um, gouache. I use everything that mixes with water. And it doesn't, I'm not, you know, so pure that I wouldn't use writ dye if it came into my mind. I might. I don't know. I haven't used it yet, but I might start any moment. And I think that's about all I have here for, and then, of course, Liquitex also makes inks. And I use some of their colored inks as well. When I need really deep, deep, deep colors that my transparent watercolors won't give me, I use Liquitex inks. Is that, is that alcohol inks or? No, it's just water. This is, um, it's just, um, it's called a professional acrylic ink. But it's, you know, water-based, so. And these, of course, are incredibly intense. So you don't need much of this. This is actually green. Will you use um, your same brushes, like if you're using alcohol ink? I don't use alcohol. I don't know how to do alcohol. I mean, not alcohol, ink, but the, the acrylic ink. Would you use the same brushes as your watercolor? No. I have, I have my, my Fort Knox brushes. And... Um, I, I don't touch anything to them but the purest of watercolors. And then I have, you know, the, the, the 24 brushes for $3.07 brushes, and I use those. Okay. And yeah. Then you just wash with water. I do, I just wash with water. And um, I have a little man in Munich, a little pal. I, I went to school and taught at the university there, and um, I have a man at the end of my, at Parkstrasse, who rebuilds. Sable brushes. That is his job in life. He rebuilds brushes. So every now and then he gets a package of my brushes. And I, you know, I don't know. He's, maybe he has those sable squirrels in his garage. I don't know. <laughs> but he seems to be able to fix them. Even when there's, you know, some sort of <sighs> pestilence in Russia getting these squirrels to die. Causing the squirrels to die, you know, he, one day I did get a note from him and it said, it said he was having difficulty because of rabies in Russia. And I thought, 
rabies in Russia. Okay, fine. You know, I mean, when you're teaching and a kid comes in and says that the dog ate his homework, you think, yeah, huh? I heard that last year. But when the sables have rabies, I don't, okay, fine. I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. Oh, gosh. Any other questions? Yeah. And, uh, speaking of sable, sable by any? Kalinsky. Uh, they're Kalinskys. Okay. Minor. Uh, these, I, yeah. They're Kalinskys. Is that the only kind that you would say to get? Over the oh, I wouldn't say to get those to start with. I would make sure I liked it before I started. Okay, another question. I mean, before I bought expensive, expensive. You can buy very nice brushes without them being Kalinskys. You can. They're, they're a, who else uses what? What do you use, Brian? I use Windsor Newtons. Brushes? Okay. And, but they're sables. Okay. There's one. Yeah. It's sable is the, is the, is the key word. Okay. Good. That's good. Yeah. And the liquid watercolors. I'm not really familiar with those. Do you think you can buy, buy them here in town? I think yeah. um, Paige Martin is at uh, Michael's. Or Hobby Lobby. Yeah, Hobby Lobby. Oh, really? yeah. Yeah. They may have some colors at Hobby Lobby, but I don't think they have full sets. No. no. But you don't need you don't need a full set. Just gets I mean when I started painting, I had no art supplies whatsoever. I bought three colors off the shelf and just took them home and played with them. Okay. Then of course I decided I had to have all of them. <laughs> <laughs> right after that it, it just happened. Anything else? Okay. Anyone else? Oh, come on, I know you have a question. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, the um, liquid watercolors, the student grade ones that you have, mm -hmm. do you worry about um, you know, um, archival quality or the fading and things like that when you use it for like a background? Yeah, you know, usually um, these, they're pretty light, fast. Just simp simply, well, first of all, none of them is forever. Just get that through your head right in the beginning. Anything you put down with watercolor is going to leave you every day a little bit more. You can put it in a dark spot and it won't go as fast, but it's still leaving you every single day. So you have to choose. Enjoy, I mean, it's for what I, I'm doing and the amount of space I'm covering. Oftentimes they just use this to, to, to uh, in the beginning, it's sort of as if sketching, but I sketch with a color so I can tell that this is going to be a leaf and this is going to be a flower. Because sometimes I've painted leaves with flower colors when I haven't just washed it in very, 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 very lightly. And so I'll, I'll use this cheaper color to fill in to show me where, where things are. And just very, very, very light. You can hardly tell it's even tinted. It's just tinted water. And that's, what that, that's often what I use this for. Um, sometimes on the big pieces like the scarves and things that it's never going to, it's never going to be a, a, hung as a painting. I mean, I paint the background with these because it's not going to matter because it's going to be printed on silk. And, and you, you have to think what your end product is going to be as well. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a scarf, do you paint the pattern onto watercolor <coughs> and then it gets printed onto the silk? I paint, on silk. I paint on my regular paper. In fact, this, this, this painting was turned into a scarf. I don't know why. I don't think I have anything. Um, this painting was turned into a scarf. All right? And then so, you put the background in, uh, in the process. Well, there, yeah. That's where the Photoshop comes in. Because um, I paint the colors that I want with my watercolor paints. So that's, we'll say, the, this, oh, here, Hannah can stand up, okay? So here, this has got an ombre color scheme to it right here. You can see it goes down to this color green. 
right? So what I do is I paint a, a panel. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> I paint a panel of just the background colors. Then we photograph those. And then Photoshop is very smart. Photoshop can read those colors, turn it into Pantone colors. Pantone colors turn it into ink for printing and ink for silk. Okay, so you don't have to rely on your eye. The computer reads it. So then um, before I have, say, 10 scarves made, I send, we, send, we send the files to the printers in San Francisco. They print, they print up a, a, a sample and send it back to me. And we look at the colors, we check everything, we look at the edges, you know, just, just really inspect it, go over it with a fine tooth comb, and then we, yes or no. If the colors need to be changed, we change the colors. But I, I can't rely on the computer to make the colors. So then before it goes back, if it has to be changed, we've made the, 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 this layer, it goes to them just like this, that bird of paradise. Goes to them on a white background like this, and they get another file with the background, the ombre. And then they overlay it in their computers and put it on their printer. I'll just give you a little aside. The first time I tried this, and Ann knows this story. Uh, the first day I decided to print my scarves, I'd done all this research, and I found this company in New York. And um, so, okay, really brave. We're going to send our things off to be printed today. Like the first day of school, you know, it's really hard, and it's, will they turn out, all these questions. Well, anyway, we're transmitting. Now, these images are like 750,000 bytes. You know, they're huge files. They, have to, they can't go through AOL or any of your normal protocols. There's a special way to send them. So I'm sending, we're sending the files off. We're sending five scarves. And um, about the first one was being sent, and it takes a long while to get all this data through. And I see up in the corner of the screen this little Chinese character. Hello, Al. Karen Harding in Rockford, Illinois. I see, I, I'm, we're transmitting to you, and I see a little Chinese character up in the corner. And he said, oh, honey, don't worry about that. No. And I, he said, it's, it's just a registry mark. I said, oh, honey, I know all about registry marks. <laughs> and they're never Chinese unless a Chinese technician is printing them. Oh. You promised me these were printed in New York. Where are they being printed? Uh -huh. And in, when I discovered that character, I told Tom, my, my printer, stop transmission. Just cut it off. So this line sort of was uh, mute for a while. And he said, oh, well, you know, we've run into problems with our printers, and we have to, we're sending just this, just this one time we're going to send it to China. I said, no, sorry. That's it. So um, the next day on their website, there was my scarf. Actually, it's, it's one similar to the poppies that I had back there. Um, and it ha mine had an ombre background. Theirs had a running bond brick pattern behind it. And there, was my, there were my poppies with bricks behind them. And the scarf cost $3. Karen was a mad camper. So I looked and looked and looked again, and I found a place in San Francisco. And my next door neighbor's child is a banker in San Francisco. I said, Ellen, put on your banker clothes. Go down to this place for me and actually see if they have presses and if the presses are running. Because they could have their address in San Francisco. They could get the data. They could send it to China. It could be back on the next plane mm -hmm. and ship it from San Francisco. And how would I know? So my little Ellen goes, Dick, da, 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 da. I said, make friends with this man I've been talking to, Sanjay, and see what's going on. 
So little Ellen goes down there, da, 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 da. She calls me back and she has all these pictures and she said, the presses were really running and they're running church banners, Karen. I think they're okay. <laughs> so they've been doing my printing ever since. It's, it's, it's not the easiest way to do it, but it's all done in America. All my printing is done in Rockford, Illinois. My glass that I make is all done in, in Indiana. And um, the scarves are made in San Francisco. They'd be, they'd be just minimally expensive if they, if they were done in China. It, really, it would really be night and day difference. What item do you sell in glass? What? Uh, who, uh, Ara has coasters and I have Lazy Susans. Oh. Big Lazy Susans. Oh. How many, you were talking about lithography, how many layers of color are you actually running? Is it like, you know, a layer of black and... I, I think, I, I don't know how they run their presses, but I think it's, I think it's seven inks. Does anyone know about like the big Epson printers? I mean, they have a Heidelberg press. I know they run, run things on this Heidelberg because they run, they run like 48 cards on one sheet through and then it's all cut. But um, if, if anyone know about the big Epson printers, how many inks they have in them? Do they have seven or, or 11 inks? Seven. Mm -hmm. I think they have seven. Well, they... That's how we start initially, you know, with, with the colors. What's the difference between that and G Clay? G Clay is, is, is like through an Epson printer. It, it's liquid ink, but it's put down in, G Clay simply means dots. It's put down in dots. Lithography is, is run through a plate. There's, a, there's an actual digital plate that runs the, through the press. The paper runs through, you know, it's not... Uh, think of it as a roller, you know, like when you put a brayer down. Mm -hmm. Think of the brayer having the, the, the pattern in it. That's, that's the difference when the, with the lithography. And this can be much more intense. Okay. But don't be, don't be put off by a gicle print. Because if, you were gonna, if I were going to hold this piece up, which is a, a print, and the original right here, and you put both of them out in the sun, or... To exposed to any light, the G clay print would be much brighter, much longer than the original watercolors. So if you're gonna, if you're thinking about putting something up, save your original somewhere and put a print up. I mean, you know you've got the original, but this will stay more intense. And now I'm not saying every printer will be honest enough to print it properly, but you've got to trust the person who's doing it. And also, we print on art paper, there's special art paper. And I first thought, well, I'll just touch something up. Ha, what a joke. You put watercolor on this paper and it just goes yeah. like that. It's, it, so what's here has to stay here. I mean, you can go over it with a pen or a pencil or something, but you can't touch it up. Yes. Before you were talking about not getting sharp edges with watercolor, do you ever go in and sharpen an edge with maybe a watercolor pencil or anything like that? I don't. Um, I usually sharpen it up only on the computer. But if I'm not going to print something to be a card or a scarf, if, if I'm like this piece I'm working on now, these, this watercolor thing, I mean these water lilies, yes, I do. And I, I use a lot of the Japanese um, brushes that hold the, the, the color, and I paint with those. The only problem is they have acrylic tips. So the brush is acrylic, and it won't, it won't hold a good line. I mean, it's a line. It's better than you can do sometimes. But I often find with a 2-0 brush I, and a magnifying glass, I can do just as well by hand. Well, we'll see how long that's going to last. We're getting a little jittery. So we never paint with coffee. <laughs> yes, Brian. Or oh, Alan. Um, do you ever use like a liquid frisket or frisket paper at all for defining lines or separating? I've used frisket, but you can't, you can't really get a sharp. I don't know, maybe other people can, but I've never been able to get a really, really, really sharp line with frisket. 
even when it's thin. Can you get a really sharp line, Brian? No. And it, it does, no matter what you think. If you look with a magnifying glass, you're removing your paper as you pull it up. And you're affecting how your, the rest of the paint is going to go down. If you're going to cover it. Any other questions? Do you paint flat or elevated? I paint flat. I, my pieces are too big. You know, I'd, I'd, yeah, the, the big piece um, that I'm painting now, as I say, it's being painted on, I have a eight foot by four foot table, and it's, it's there and it's taped down in sections. Well, I mean, piece, parts of the, of the whole piece. And I use blue painter's tape. I don't use artist tape. It's, you know, that's a joke. Well, I mean, if you use it, it's okay, but it's expensive. <laughs> Yeah, and I just, I just use, um, sometimes I use frog tape and sometimes I just use the blue artist tape. Blue painter's tape. Blue painter's tape, yes, excuse me. Anything else? Yes. And that color doesn't throw you off? What color? Oh, it's only on the edge. You know. I like that color, actually. I like to paint that color. But mo most of the flowers aren't blue. <laughs> That's my problem. You know, these pink flowers is not my favorite colors. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. You from real life? I do. You go out to your garden and... Well, I, I, I do that. I bring the flowers inside, but I also just take a photograph of it. Okay. Or I may, I've been watching my uh, hibiscus plant all summer, and every, like, every day I take a couple of photographs of it because I'm really interested in how the buds twist open. So I want it to be like seven photographs. I'm going to have the bud opening in seven stages. That's anything else? Thanks, you've been great.